Um, it's my pleasure to be here today, and um, I, I'm really passionate about land trusts and um, about private property and the importance that uh, the role that private property and the importance that land trusts can provide for um, for all of our quality of life that we enjoy in the Carolinas. It's it's so important, and you know what I'm what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, is the importance not just of a culture or of people, of hum the human race or, or our nation, but the importance that every single person, every single one of us, and the importance of every single person to the natural world. Um, and it's really easy sometimes to feel overburdened by what's going on uh, in the world and feel like you make no difference. You do. People can make a huge difference. What is my grandmother reading to me out of the Manual of Vascular Flora of the Carolinas? She, I used to get in trouble for saying the common names. So I have a problem with common names. You know, like when, when she sent me looking for trillium, she'd pay me a quarter for every trillium I could put a little flag next to on our, our property in the mountains. But I had to come back and report on whether it was trillium undulatum, trillium sulcatum, or trillium erectum. If I said Wake Robin, it wasn't good enough. I didn't get my quarter. Okay? So, um, she had a huge uh, impact, um, not, not because she was um, just encouraging and protecting uh, land, but um, because she influenced me. Um, if you don't believe that, that a single person can have an impact, you can look at my grandmother, look at the strict and the wonderful um, gift that they've given the world here, which is, is just awe-inspiring. I'd never been to this place until today, and I can tell you just driving in, just the just sheer look and the beauty of, that this place is it just gave me goosebumps off the bat. And then to come in and see the wonderful things that are going around uh, the, and the energy around this place, just incredible. So thank you so much for that, that wonderful gift. Um, so personal space, how important are we? I'm also the director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden and the, and the Bob Campbell Geology Museum, and they give me lots of titles. And, and each one involves about 80 hours a week, so my <laughs> wife will tell you. <laughs> I do everything except sleep, but, and occasionally she takes me to get a haircut. Um, like I said, a lot of things going on in the world, and most of us who are in this room are concerned about these, these major issues um, that, that really confront us um, on a global scale uh, that we're just we're slammed with all the time, you know, from, from massive droughts, changing climate, you know. Uh, we kind of, in this room, we just kind of accept that climate change happens and we're not going to talk about where it came from because we don't bring up the politi politicized end, but we bring up the reality that, that uh, you know what, climate changes has changed in the, pl in the past. If you don't believe climate change happens, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> As, you know, that's why there's no woolly mammoths or saber-toothed cats around and, and why, you know, we know New York was under two kilometers of ice 18,000 years ago. That's not a guess. It happened. And why is it not there anymore? It's because of climate change. So, you know, I'm, I, one of the things I think is our biggest challenge as a society, more so in the United States than anywhere else in the world, is the divisions that separate us these days. Now, if, if I could work to, to change one thing, it would be to, to get rid of the divisions. Um, and to, to, for us to realize that it's a heck of a lot more important to focus on the things we actually can do something about together than it is to spend so much time tearing each other down. All right? So that's, that's so important. Um, and climate change is one of those issues where we can do it. So anyway, how important are we and how important are our backyards? That's, that's kind of what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at a couple examples that are on a really big scale, and then we're going to bring it back into like a really small scale about how important each one of our backyards are. But, you know, your personal space, your private property, um, just like the botanical gardens, um, and we, both of us, whether you're in South Carolina or North Carolina, we have two wonderful state botanical gardens that both believe in the same thing, which is that a botanical garden, our mission is really to, to illustrate to people the sense of empowerment that you can have um, from looking at man's influence both ways, how much we get from the natural world and how much the natural world depends on us. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. My, my motto at the South Carolina Botanical Garden kind of is throw down a shell and change the world. We'll talk more about that later. Um, speaking of personal choices and how much they can impact our diversity and our quality of life, how many people hate butterflies in this room? <laughs> right? Even if you do, you're scared to raise your hand at this point. Right? Well, um, Talk about a powerful cata catalyst to discuss the importance of 
personal space. The news that's been going on right now about what has happened in the past couple years in Mexico has caused this knee-jerk reaction where all of a sudden we're like, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? We can't possibly lose one of the most charismatic and important species of butterfly to, to the human race on the, I mean, monarchs, for goodness sake. It's not just, a, monarchs aren't just found in the eastern United States. Monarchs aren't just found in North America. They're, they're really a worldwide butterfly. But our monarchs um, all migrate to this one place, a couple valleys in Mexico, Mexico, the, the most famous um, El Rosario, where that picture was taken, are home to millions of butterflies in the wintertime. You know, it's not just the same butterfly that you see hatch out uh, of, a, of a chrysalis here. It isn't exactly the same butterfly that makes it to Mexico because they go through several successive generations uh, you know, on the way here. And then on the way back, you have a super generation, right, uh, which is there that, that, that makes the trip all the way to the Valley of Mexico from near the, near the border of the United States, overwinters and then breeds and, and those successive generations come back. So we're talking about multiple generations. It's not like a bird where the bird flies back and forth many times. A single monarch will never make both directional trips there and back. But that, that incredible importance that Mexico to these butterflies means that what happens in El Rosario is going to determine whether or not we have butterflies in our backyard, monarchs in our backyard. And we all learned in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, depending on which state you grew up in, it's all part of the curriculum. You all learned about life cycles and kept those monarchs, right, on milkweed and watched them transform. And what a wonderful thing and, and resource for students. And there's a reason why I think it's connected to a lot of us. Uh, very intensely. And of course, in 1996 to 1997, there was about 18 hectares of butterflies. That's, I don't know, 39 or so acres. Um, and now in 13 and 14 last winter, there was only less than a half, or less than, um, than 0.6, it was 0.56 hectares of monarchs. So they've just gone in the dumps. And the good news is a lot of effort this year going into uh, this, these projects working with monarchs and, and planting things like lots and lots of milkweed has resulted in already uh, a much larger population at returning to Mexico. The first ones got there on November 2nd. If you're part of Monarch Watch, like I am, you know that November 2nd, the first butterflies got back and already we ha it looks like we have a slight uptick from last year, but they're still in big trouble. And they're in big trouble not because the Mexicans haven't protected El Rosario because those people who live around El Rosario make all of their money from people like you and me going to El Rosario to see those butterflies in December and January. But it's what's happening here that's really changed that. And it's a change in the style for which we're managing our property, managing our land, particularly in places like Oklahoma and Texas, Arkansas and Kansas. States that these monarch butterflies have to go through that are almost entirely agriculturalized. And the type of agriculture we have today has, has eliminated a, a sizable patch of milkweed, pretty sizable, one about the size of the state of Indiana has been eliminated. 24 million acres of weedy area in between row crop fields of soybean, cotton, rice have been eliminated because now we plant all those crops as genetically modified organisms that can withstand Roundup, which means we don't have as messy a field. There's not as many uh, uh, weeds around, which consequently means there's not as much milkweed around. When there's not as much milkweed around, the generations of butterfly that have to make it through that region and have to breed have nowhere to lay their eggs. So the, this is a bad thing, but it's also something that every, each and every one of us can do something about. Throughout the range of milkweeds, we're losing milkweeds because we're not just losing those kind of weedy areas, but we're losing early successional habitat. And so planting milkweeds in your backyard particularly if you guys know anybody in central or northern Texas or Oklahoma or Kansas, <laughs> encourage them to plant milkweeds in the backyard. And this, I mean, I mean, we have planted millions and millions of milkweeds this year. Literally, this has been, we cannot keep a milkweed at the South Carolina Botanical Garden because so many people want to buy them this year because everybody has heard about this and heard how every person can make a difference in providing that critical pathway 
back and forth from Mexico. And, you know, it looks like it may actually be happening. So we all learned kind of on that, that milkweed in the first slide, which, believe it or not, I took that picture in Polk County. I just thought about that um, when I stuck it up there right on my way. I used to drive back to Wilkesboro, come up to 74 through uh, Columbus there, and uh, go up to my mom's house that way. And right along 74 is a wonderful patch of milkweed right after you turn out of Columbus where I took that picture. But there's numerous species, you know. So planting milkweed, um, uh, all of the species of milkweed are food for, for monarchs, so a e pretty easy thing to do. <laughs> um, I'm going to cage most of my talk on, on talking about migra migration. Uh, and of course, the animals we think of as migratory, perhaps more than any other, are birds. And I'll be honest with you, um, I wasn't a big fan of birds to begin with in my career. Um, now I'm known as the bird guy. <laughs> uh, but I'm a botanist. And really, birds kind of had to come to me for me to really get it. You know, um, this is a beautiful Florida scrub jay, which is about as non-migratory as you get. A Florida, Florida scrub jays uh, will spend their whole life in about a, a two-hectare size parcel of property. So they're, they're not very much world travelers, but a lot of birds are. But what I love about birds two things, um, and what really caught me and, and attracted me to birds are really two things. Birds, uh, A, uh, are, are often migratory. And they're great sentinels of the health of our ecosystems. And small changes in the way we use land represent themselves in rapid and very dramatic changes in the bird populations that we see. Um, and the fact they're migratory is a lot of them moving from pole to pole, like the Arctic tern moves from, from pole to pole during the year. So what is the habit of the Arctic tern? Everything in the entire world, right? So if you like Arctic terns being part of your natural heritage, well, then you better be concerned about what goes on off the coast of Antarctica as much as you are concerned about what goes on in Barrow, Alaska, as much as you are concerned about the nutrient discharge from the Carolinas out into the Atlantic Ocean. It pulls together the whole world because they're migratory. Second thing I love about birds is, again, just like monarch butterflies, how many people hate birds? <laughs> Depends on the bird. Okay, you got a bird you don't like. What is the, what is the bird you don't like? Starlings. Starlings. Is there any other birds you don't like? Grackles. English sparrows. English sparrows. Brown-headed cowbird. I'm so glad you said that. We're going to talk about brown-headed cowbirds a little bit. <laughs> kind of interesting. So. What I love about this is I, I really like to challenge people on my show without them even knowing they're being challenged. You know, so uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about things that um, for for my neighbor Lindsey Graham who, down in Pendleton, uh, he would get slammed uh, for talking about and did get slammed for talking about cap and trade and and controlling carbon emissions um, back in a couple years ago and and totally changed his platform on it because of it. Um, we get slammed talking about this in the political arena, but I can get away with it because I don't politicize it and I sneak it in there using birds, right? So here's a great example of that. Um, these are parrots, obviously, and where I took the picture of the parrots is really kind of interesting. The one on the left is a red crowned parrot, the one on the right, that beautiful couple, that is a green parakeet, which is actually a type of small macaw. It's actually bigger than the, uh, the red uh, crowned Amazon that's on the left. And both of those were taken in Brownsville, Texas. And both of those attract tens of thousands of crazed birders like myself to go to Brownsville and go to this park, downtown park in the middle of Brownsville, entirely rough Latino neighborhood that we go to to, to see these parrots come into these, um, into these eucalyptus trees. And we go there because they count as native birds for the United States and we get to check them off of our, our checklist. <laughs> and they're freaking parrots. I mean, it's pretty cool. Parrots are neat to see. Um, so the neat part about these parrots is the story behind the parrots, and it involves change and choice in people's backyards in Brownsville. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, there are actually nine species of parrots that live in Brownsville, um, but most of those parrots are escaped cage birds. Most of them uh, have escaped because people were smuggling them into the United States when they're crossing illegally, and they get caught and they cut open the cages and they don't want to get caught with endangered species, so lilac crowned Amazons and white uh, crowned Amazons and yellow fronted. You have the whole slew of of parrots that have established themselves in these cities in South Texas because of being released cage birds. These two are not released cage birds. These two birds moved on their own into Brownsville and 
as a consequence, cavity nesting birds, like these parrots that take over the cavities of woodpeckers, um, their nest sites became basically non-existent. Now, these birds can live 60 or 70 years. So they lasted quite a while without having a place to breed, looking and looking for somewhere to breed. Same time they were agriculturalizing Tamalipas, we were also shipping as many people from Ohio and Michigan and the Midwest down to Harlingen, McAllen, and Brownsville to retire as possible. And in the process, they moved to, <laughs> they moved to these wonderful places, this wonderful climate, where um, they wanted to have a palm tree. Everyone planted. Everyone planted this Washingtonia palm, and in 1982, there was a massive frost that killed most of the Washingtonias in Brownsville, Harlingen, and McAllen. Well, when the palms died in their yard, a lot of people didn't really take them out, and a woodpecker came and made a nest in it. You don't want to take the, the tree down when a woodpecker has a nest in it because we all love birds, so they left that tree, planted a new palm, and right after the next year, in 1983, the very first Red crown parrots and green parakeets showed up in McAllen, Harlingen, and Brownsville simultaneously to take advantage of those cavities that were in the trees in those, in those border towns. And today, we will drive or fly to Brownsville to see these and check them off our list, and we're so happy to have them. And what are they? They're illegal immigrants who crossed the Rio Grande. <laughs> to make a better future for their families. <laughs> so, pretty cool, isn't it? It's pretty interesting how our, our opinions, and you have no idea how many people I've taken to Texas who, who just can't stand Mexican immigrants that, that have gone to see these birds. <laughs> And as you're standing in this wonderful neighborhood in Brownsville, um, and Brownsville is, is an entirely uh, Latino uh, community today, and as you're standing there and the people are coming up and talking to you about the parrots and they're, they're speaking English, they're not speaking Spanish to you, and it really can be a life changer um, for people just to be associated with birds. So um, it's a neat little story, um, but this one's right in our backyard here, and it's something I really want us to think about today, which is what is natural? We just looked at an example of, of humans interacting with parrots and changing their natural distribution. But what is natural for us here? Um, and I'm going to use an, an, an example from right in this area, the, the upstate of North Carolina, of South Carolina and the adjacent Piedmont slash um, mountain interchange, this sort of upper Piedmont belt of our two states is a great example. Um, when we think of the natural habitat, out there in the uplands, in the dry areas away from the, the, the steep slopes and the coves along streams. When we think about the land that we live on, the places we make our homes, and we think about what is natural out there. If I was to describe what's natural, it'd probably be something like our backyard. You know, oaks, hickories, pines, tulip poplars, sweet gums in this forest that we can't wait to get away from so we can get up to the mountains and see forests that have lots of wildflowers in them because ours tend to be pretty depauperate in terms of what is going on underneath that dense um, layer of loblolly pine soaks and, uh, and hickories. So oak hickory forest is what we think of as natural on our uplands. Um, and I'm going to kind of challenge you to, to maybe rethink what natural is today um, by telling you the story of how we got there. Um, and it's going to be told around um, birds. So if this will work, kick in, kick in. There you go. Show you three, um, three types of birds that either come through the Carolinas or make their home here. Um, and they represent three different ecological guilds. This bird is, of course, a Baltimore Oriole, one of the most beautiful black birds on the planet. Believe it or not, you don't like grackles, but you like Baltimore Orioles just because they're orange. <laughs> Um, and this bird loves backyards, open habitats, savannas. The, the chat is a great example of what we call an early successional bird. This is a bird you go to power lines, clear cuts, old fields to find that bird, um, places that people have really messed up. The oven bird, which I really regret I don't have a song on here because he ain't the world's most beautiful bird, but he has one of the most uh, intense songs of any of our birds. Oven birds, and because he's not quite as flashy, I'll show you a really flashy one here, the scarlet tanager, um, are examples, two species of birds that are examples of birds that need extensive blocks of 80-year-old or older forest. 
um, to successfully breed. Matter of fact, oven birds need 280 consecutive acres uninterrupted, even by a paved road, of 80 plus year old trees to successfully raise one nest of young. It's been heavily studied up in New England, um, and even though we haven't studied it heavily here, you see the same, you see this easily the same uh, pattern here, where if you want to see an oven bird, you go to older forests. If you want to see a scarlet tanager, you go to older forests. And the reason this oven bird has to have such a huge block of land of old growth forests really to, to, to breed is because they make their nests on the ground in this little nest that looks like an oven. That's how they get their name like a pizza oven, okay? And because it's a ground nesting bird, any predator in the world can walk up to it and eat the babies. And so nesting in the center of the forest takes you away from the cruising range of things like those, koi dogs, <laughs> and, um, and foxes, and raccoons, and predators, which tend to patrol the edges of forests because that's higher productivity habitat. There's more food there. So the males that are at the center of forest patches are more successful in courting females because their nests that they build are less predated, okay, safer place to build your nest. The um, beautiful uh, scarlet tanager needs about 100 to 120 acres of contiguous forest breed. So anyway, there's three different groups. One that likes backyards, one that likes um, clear cuts and um, um, cow fields, old pastures, old fields like that, and then um, our old growth forest. So here's your quiz. Uh, which group of birds, ecological guild, we call them in the, in the conservation community, which one of those ecological guilds do you think is doing the worst? Which ones are in the most, most trouble? How many, how many people think it's the uh, backyard bird? Okay, okay good for you. Uh, how many of you guys think it's the clear cut bird? Okay, how many old growth forest? Right? Okay, oh, you're all wrong. Oh, goodness. You're all wrong. It's, it's birds like the eastern meadowlark. Um, it's the early successional birds. Birds that need clear cuts, that need old power lines, that need cow fields are the birds that are in the biggest trouble, not just here in the eastern United States, but worldwide. Matter of fact, eastern meadowlarks have underwent a decline of 90% of their population level in the last 50 years alone. This is a bird we're very worried about. It's still considered a G5. It's still a common bird, but we're really worried about it because every single year on the Christmas counts, our numbers of meadowlarks continue to plummet just exponentially. And in the county I grew up in, in Allegheny County, North Carolina, um, this was the most common sound in the spring to me. When, and I knew it was spring when I heard that incredible noise, the, the sound that the meadowlark makes. It's one of the most beautiful. It's another black bird that you love, by the way, uh, because it's not black. Um, but the eastern meadowlark um, it was common in my county because we had uh, almost the entire county was dairy farms when I grew up. There's one active dairy in Allegheny County today. And instead of, instead of growing cows, we grow uh, just like many other places like Harlingen, we grow retirees and Christmas trees today. <laughs> Turns out to be a lot less work, a lot less labor intensive. Um, and. Uh, as a consequence of our shifting our patterns, we've seen a shift in the natural diversity of native birds that we are able to enjoy. Um, so it's, it's, it's you know, interesting, if I, if, why is this the case? Why are grassland birds so endangered today? It's because we're losing grasslands faster than any other habitat on Earth. Because grasslands in our neck of the woods really require the human touch to be maintained. And we can see this. Um, when we really look at man's hand as a force of change, um, and man is being part of nature rather than being apart from it. So this is a view, I love this view, looking out from Glassy Mountain in Pickens County, um, of you know, all of the perturbations that we've made as you look up towards the Blue Ridge Escarpment where we sit right now today. Um, this is looking right up towards us from Pickens County, South Carolina, um, up into the beautiful Blue Wall, we call it, in South Carolina. And you look at all the things people have done in the foreground of that picture and you think, wow, we really messed things up. But a matter of fact, those, those activities have been going on here for quite a while, quite a while. The world did not start to be changed by man here in, in, North, in the Carolinas um, with the founding of Charleston, even though they'd like you to think that in Charleston. Um, <laughs> it's been going on for a long, long time. And here's a good example, a cowbird. Right? Well, I hate cowbirds. Why do we hate cowbirds? They do. They have this wonderful behavior called brood parasitism. 
Oh, we hate them for that. I, I've seen, uh, I do this Wild Acres retreat thing each spring for the, up at, uh, in Little Switzerland. I just love it. And we always do a, a bird walk as part of that, uh, that. If you don't go to the Wild Acres retreat, you should find out about it. It's a great weekend um, to take families and really just experiencing everything there is to experience right there on the Blue Ridge Escarpment, uh, nature out there. And, you know, we walk along that trail and last, or year before last, I was doing my bird walk out there and we had a lovely pair of Blackburnian warblers that were coming back and forth feeding their young. And these little Blackburnian warblers, these hot orange and black, beautiful, one of, probably my favorite warbler that we have in the Appalachians. Uh, little bitty birds like this were feeding a great big, <laughs> ugly brown cowbird. And that's why we don't like them. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And we think of them as non-native birds in South Carolina. Because um, they, of course, we all know invaded South Carolina in the 1950s through the 70s. And when they came in, they completely changed the, the diversity of birds around us. They lowered populations of things like song sparrows and Blackburnian warblers. But we have to challenge this with some research that I'm doing in conjunction with the, um, the Natural History Museum London, the Jardin de Plantes in France, and Furman University, um, supported by the Mellon Foundation, we're actually going through and we're looking at all of the collections and the writings and the letters that the early colonial botanists uh, made uh, when, they, when Europeans were colonizing the Carolinas. They were at the same time shipping back thousands and thousands of artifacts. And the, some of the most uh, esteemed artifacts they shipped back were things like plants and birds. And this is the very first image ever made of a brown-headed cowbird, which Mark Catesby called the cowpen bird. And that bird was, that image was made from a bird that he saw in Charleston, South Carolina in, in 1723. So are, are cowbirds native to South Carolina? Apparently so. Apparently so. And we're finding lots of things in our studies of Mark Catesby that tells us. My wife would tell you I have a, a man crush on Mark Catesby, and she's, she's pretty right. I mean, the guy was like, he, he's been dead 300 years, so we're safe, we're all good. But um, Mark Catesby uh, was a really observant guy. He came to the New World in 1712 to visit his sister, who was a Virginia colony, but he came to South Carolina, came back to the New World in 1723 as, a, as sort of a seasoned naturalist to really observe and describe and send back to England everything he could find for a couple of wealthy guys, one at Oxford and one in London, uh, Hans Sloan and a guy named Delinius. And so when he was sending uh, specimens back, he was also drawing and, and it, recording lots of information on what South Carolina was like in the 1720s. And this guy was double tough, man. He walked twice from Charleston to Clemson. 1723 and 1724, once in the spring, once in the fall when European habitation only extended 60 miles inland from the coast. So he was spending most of his time in what was then Indian territories. And he was finding lots of things like cowbirds um, that we wouldn't think of being in, the, in South Carolina for many, many years. And the reason the cowbirds were here is because buffalo were here. So this, this brood parasitism is actually an incredible adaptation to making your living around a large ungulate, the bison. American bison, which is continually moving, never sits still, always migratory, always transient. And if you're getting your shade, your perch, your food, all from the activities of a bison, you have to follow them. And if you're following them every day, you don't have time to stop and raise young. So they, they develop this wonderful adaptation of laying their eggs in the nest of another bird and then moving on with the bison. Yeah? So pretty cool. That's why they do it, right? Now, how many buffalo do we have in Polk County, North Carolina today? Some. Some. Yeah, we've got, we're actually bringing them back in, as in a major way on some farms. But in general, we don't think about bison as being a native animal in North Carolina, South Carolina, but it was native to both. Um, and matter of fact, Mark Catesby, there's a wonderful letter he wrote back to, to Hans Sloan saying how tired he was of eating elk and bison on his trips to Clem up to Clemson uh, before Clemson existed because all his Cherokee guides would do was, would, hunt, would be to hunt bison and elk. And he was like, I'd, I'd give anything for a brace of coney um, because he was so tired of eating bison and nothing else. And we think of that as very strange, but in fact, 
fact, um, this guy was documenting not just the, the animals, but the plants, and, and they're totally different from what we think of today. He was like me, he was a botanist, so he, he drew the bison, but his uh, words actually are about the tree, because the buffalo was just a buffalo, and the tree is really cool. Um, so why were the bison here? He, he tells, he saw, uh, and I'll read this kind of like in Middle English, but uh, I never saw any of these trees, but at one place near the Appalachian Mountains where buffaloes had left their dung, and some of the trees had their branches pulled down, from which I conjecture they had been browsing on the leaves. What with the bright verdure of the leaves and the beauty of its flowers, few trees make a more elegant appearance. I visited them again at the proper time to get some seeds, but the ravaging Indians had burnt the woods many miles round and totally destroyed them to my great disappointment. So that all I was able to procure this spacious tree was some specimens of it which remain in Hortosicus of Sir Hound Sloan. Over and over again, Mark Catesby, John Lawson, Joseph Lord, um, all of these early collectors, all these early explorers that, we are, uh, that we're researching, they all talk about the fact that everywhere they went in the upstate of the Carolinas, the woods were burned everywhere in March. And it was the ravaging Indians who were doing it. And, and why was the tree there, what he didn't understand? Why was this weird pink flowered tree that normally only today only grows up on top of, of uh, places like Whiteside Mountain where it can get some sunlight on the edge of the rock outcrops, was growing in Aiken County, South Carolina when Mark Catesby was around because of the fire. And why were the bison here and elk? He describes the upstate of South Carolina as being a vast plain of grass interrupted by trees. That's something he called a savanna because they didn't have the word prairie back then. Um, but he called it a savanna of grass taller than his horse's head, right? That extended for miles, populated by herds of elk and bison being pursued by wolves. This was the upstate of South Carolina in his day. And he talks about the soil. If you read the, the appendix to the natural history even, he talks about being able to push his hand all the way in up to the elbow in the beautiful, dark, rich, black soil, the richest he'd seen since he left England. And he couldn't understand why these people would make their living off of animal flesh and small patches of transient uh, corn, beans, and, gourd, and uh, uh, pumpkin that they would plant when they could exploit this and make lots of money in international commerce because the soil was so rich. Now, all of us garden with that beautiful black soil today, right? <laughs> Is that right? Matter of fact, we're, we've, we're so far removed from it, we don't even have a, a historical memory of it, a shared common uh, tale of that soil that was here so long ago. Um, but it was here, and there's some places where it still exists, and um, it, it was built by the very grasses that built the bison, that built the elk, that built the, the commerce, the quality of life for the Native Americans. The reason they burned was to create higher productivity, to create game, to create open spaces in the bottomlands to plant their food. And in the process of burning, they increased the quality of life for themselves and created more of themselves. Same as us. Same as us, interacting with the world to increase the quality of life for their families. People are people, no matter where you go. So what if you, everything you thought of as natural in the world was really new to the world? Oh gosh, people have been in the Carolinas for about 18 to 20,000 years, we think now. And the first thing we know from every study we've ever done anywhere in the world on people is the first thing that a boy does when he goes somewhere is light it on fire. <laughs> Boys love to play with fire. Um, I was involved in a wonderful project. My first project, actually, is uh, a research project was down in the, in the Bahamas, on the largest of the Bahamas, the Andros Island, where I was working at Fofara Research Station on the Blue Holes doing fossil pollen research. And we were coordinating, cor correlating these cores of pollen and the types of trees that were there, whether they were fire dependent or needed to be ab fire, fire to be absent. And we were correlating the dates of our pollen cores in the blue holes with what the archaeologists were finding from their fire pits. And guess what? The day that people arrived on Andros Island, they burned the island down. <laughs> they really did. The minute people show up, the whole flora shifts to fire-maintained vegetation. Because human beings, everywhere they go in the world, they use fire as a tool and they manage it to create better resources for themselves. So um, for oh, since the end of the last ice age, human beings had been shaping the land in the upstate with fire. Okay. Of course, Catesby noted that soil and it got the folks in England real excited. And um, we came in in droves after we had driven away and killed off and, 
uh, it completely eliminated the Native American population. We came in and we started to plant uh, the world with things like cotton. Uh, cotton, corn, rice. Those were the three things that were planted in the upstate of South Carolina and North Carolina. Indigo in the coastal plain, but not up here, yeah. Indigo was the first crop, really important in, in South Carolina's um, economics, but strictly where it could grow down along the coast. And in the upstate, a lot of people don't know we had rice in the upstate, we did. We had an upland type of rice, a very productive type when we still had soil. Most of it though was cotton. Cassipium hirsutum, which it actually is a tree, and we had, to, we had to entrain this thing through selective breeding over a matter of only a decade or two to go from being a tree that bloomed in the wintertime to a, a plant that we could plant a seed of and get a crop the very first year. That's what I call sort of our example of unnatural selection, unless you consider people part of nature, right? And it, that is another word called shifting populations to become something else that we can't use in public called evolution, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is an example of, of human-driven evolution to really uh, serve our needs we've been doing for a long time. When we did that, we knew nothing about soil um, nutrients, we knew nothing about soil science, and we lost that 18 to 24 inches of, of uh, topsoil. And how long does it take to build an inch of topsoil? A thousand years. So we drove away 18 to 24 inches of a soft, rich soil, the kind that you see up in Illinois and Indiana called a mollusol, which is built underneath the prairie. And we ended up with badlands like this. These are pictures from the Clemson Experimental Forest uh, where, that we own at Clemson today from the Fance Grove section. You did not have to go to Custer, South Dakota to see badlands back in these days. You could see them right in Pickens and, and Anderson, the Coney County, South Carolina. Most of our landscape looked like this. So we wore out the soil. We shipped it all down to Savannah and Charleston and Wilmington and, um, and New Bern and to get all of our drainages. Now that I'm in North Carolina, I have to talk about North Carolina drainages, I guess. But, um, and we, we, we had land that was very unproductive. And then the boll weevil came. And, and of course, the Civil War took away slavery. And everything got really tough to, to make a profit with agriculture. And what happened, we all moved into town, we worked in the mills, we abandoned the fields, and the fields ended up growing up into forests, okay? And today, we have forests, where before there were cotton fields, where before that there was prairie. And my question to you is, uh, it's only forests because we, for, we keep fire out. It was only cotton field because we planted cotton. And it was only prairie because we burned. Which one's natural? <laughs> right? Have you thought about this much in the past? Okay, there is nothing natural in this world without, since the end of the last ice age, there's nothing natural in this world without considering, considering the impact that human beings have and the contribution we have to natural. All of a sudden we become very powerful. We don't just become a source of the problem, but we're a source the actual natural essence of our place. It's pretty powerful, pretty cool. Um, so at the South Carolina Botanical Garden, believe it or not, we have a chunk of land um, that is about um, nine acres uh, that we've restored this grassland that, that um, Mark Catesby talks about. And all of us think he was on, we think he was on crack anyway, buffaloes, pink flowered locusts, and <laughs> grass taller than our head. Come on, this is South Carolina. Um, but we have a patch of virgin soil that we have reestablished this prairie on. It still is a mollusol, still has the soft soil characteristics built under grass over thousands of years, 18,000 years worth of prairie being there. And it, the reason we have this virgin soil site that we've reestablished the only Piedmont prairie in the world now on, on these virgin soils because it's essentially it's an extinct community. There's only tiny little fragments and weird soils and stuff where it's been able to survive. Um, but the reason um, that we have virgin soil is because it was John C. Calhoun's cattle ranch. It was the only place he didn't plant cotton. And then it was Thomas Green Clemson's cattle ranch. And then it was Clemson University's cattle ranch. And then they planted a few apple trees out there. And then it became the South Carolina Botanical Garden. It's the only patch of our entire university campus that was never plowed. And so we have this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to illustrate something that has been extinct um, since this generation in the Carolinas. And our grasses, guess what? They're 10 and 12 feet tall. 
because instead of growing in brick hard red clay subsoil, they're growing on the original topsoil that spread out across the Piedmont of South Carolina during Catesby's time. And it's a wonderful thing. Come visit us if you've never been to the South Carolina Botanical Garden. We have a one half mile long trail, a 64 acre exhibit dedicated to not just the native plants of South Carolina, but the native habitats of the Carolinas. And you get to see everything from the rock, the soil, the hydrology, and the ecosystem processes like fire because we burn this prairie every March the same way Native Americans did for 10,000 plus years on this very site. So pretty cool stuff um, and a great example of how powerful the change is. So these grassland birds in the east, a lot of them have even gone extinct. The heath hen up in New England was an example of a grassland bird. It's a prairie chicken in Massachusetts where you don't think about prairies, but they were there too. Putting their, hand, their footprint on the land for so many years, and, so, and it hasn't been a, a short amount of time, it's been a long time. Um, all of our unique Piedmont species are either found in places where fire can't burn into, the sheltered and, and, and slopes along streams, like I, I'm willing to bet you've got some wild gingers on this property um, that maybe are of a, a federally threatened type like Hexostylus nanoflora. If not, they're certainly just a few miles away on these fire sheltered bluffs. They're only found in the Piedmont of the Carolinas, nowhere else, but in fire sheltered areas. How many species are endemic to the upland dry oak hickory forests in the Piedmont found here and nowhere else in that habitat? Zero, because that habitat's only existed since the 1930s. But in the Piedmont Prairie, almost all of our federally endangered and threatened unique Piedmont species like Schweinitz's sunflower and uh, Baptistia minor variety of barrens and Georgia aster, all these things are members of that oak savanna and prairie system that existed years and years ago. And today, they're limited to just a few sides, old graveyards, power lines, and places like South Carolina Botanical Garden. So change begins in your backyard. Um, you know, this is my friend Philip Juris's house down in Athens. Uh, Athens is a kooky place anyway with no, you know, covenants of doing, you can put anything you want. You can put an old, you know, car collection, make it into sculpture in your front yard and nobody cares in Athens. It, it exists right across the street from Philip's house. That's why I'm saying that. Um, but Philip's yard is, uh, it looks exactly like the little um, Piedmont Prairie relics that have been reestablished here right around the building. Um, bringing grasses like Indian grass. Um, and um, in his case, of course, he's got the endangered sunflower growing all over his yard because it's Philip Juris. Um, and, uh, and, and really, instead of providing a, a desert for wildlife, he's providing a haven. So, yeah, we're important. We're an important part of what goes on. And, of course, we're all red-blooded Americans in the Carolinas. <laughs> and um, I always think it's interesting to, to introduce the next topic, which is... Uh, um, when we're talking about you know, our natural heritage, really considering what our natural heritage is. Um, we love the things that are American, right? Like the, like the bald eagle being chased by a seagull there. Uh, it, actually, it actually did steal its food, too. I love to see little birds stealing big birds' food. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not just the choices we've made in our terms of our land management, but even the choices we made last Tuesday uh, are important in determining uh, what the face of our biodiversity looks like. It really is. Um, and we need to hold politicians accountable. Here's a great example. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of some things that are really American. That was a moose who had her baby behind an ice cream truck in Nome, Alaska. Alaska's a kooky place, but Nome's even kookier. Um, the elk, right? Truly an American thing. The moose, the elk, um, deer. Wonderful American thing, white-tailed deer, mule deer, um, grizzly bears, right? Think of them as a truly American thing. Um, I'll show you. I was shooting this video, and you can tell I got really scared right, <laughs> right there. I didn't know whether he was really going for the salmon or me. Um, black bears, which are doing very well now in the Carolinas, expanding the range. I'm sure there's some on this property, and um, they've expanded all the way to Chapel Hill, and they're coming in the garden. Closer. But what's more American than American bison, right? It was on nickel, for goodness sake, right? Very American. You know, that is about as American a scene as you can possibly imagine right there. A red-blooded American. Now, all those things I showed you, there's one problem with calling them American. Not a one of them is. They all walked here from somewhere else. Every one of them. Um, each one of those lineages goes back to, to Asia, and they walked across um, the Bering Land Bridge um, at the end of the last ice age. 
Um, the first bison appeared in the Great Plains of, of North America around 8,000 years ago. There's no record of American bison. There were three species before it, but there's no record of American bison until the end of the last ice age. They had to wait for the, for the ice to melt to get to the continental United States. And the massive amounts of climate change we have because our country's shaped like a funnel, our continent's shaped like a funnel, and there's this incredible flux whenever there is climate change, it means that it becomes completely racked of diversity and then has to recover. Right? So what's American? It's all based on immigrants. <laughs> it's all based on immigrants. We have always been a country of immigrants, and we always will be. Um, here's a, a, uh, something you think of as, as American, right? A jaguar, right? Don't you think about that as American? But yet, I, I, that picture was taken on a game cam we had out um, in a place called Madeira Canyon, um, which is in southern Arizona, in the Santa Rita Mountains, a place called Florida Wash at the base of the Madeira Canyon. Um, and we used, most of us probably didn't know the word jaguars in the United States. It's a federally threatened species in the United States, and we only have four right now for sure. Um, we used to have five, but one very famous one called Macho B was accidentally stressed out and killed when they put a radio collar on it. Didn't, didn't suit it, died. So now we're down to four. And you know what? Even though that's, there's only four of these left, it's not a totally dismal thing except for one problem, two problems, really. There's one problem with all four. They're all boys. <laughs> and even if they were in California, you couldn't make any more with all boys. Um, especially in Arizona, you can't. <laughs> but there's another problem. Uh, jaguars will run 250 miles to find a mate. So we could continue to have male jaguars in the United States and females in the United States if it was not for the fact that Arizona, more than any other state, has this two-tiered, two incredibly impervious to wildlife fence that runs everywhere, almost the entire length of the Arizona border, except where it's just too doggone rocky to put it in, and they're working on putting it there. So we've completely stopped the migratory corridor for things like jaguar, coati, ocelots, a huge proportion of our natural heritage that we think of as, as American too, because they can no longer come here from, from Mexico. So things like the ferruginous pygmy owl, uh, which won't refuse to fly over the fence. They, we actually find them now uh, stuck in the mesh because they only fly eight feet off the ground and it's a federally endangered species. Um, things like uh, the ocelot, the coati, but also things like the Montezuma quail, which is a very important game bird. The Mern's quail or Montezuma quail, wonderful harlequin looking thing, crazy bird that people love to go out to Arizona and shoot. But the problem is, a student I had from Texas A&M uh, did a project where he looked at the, uh, the shifts historically in the population that goes extinct in the United States about every 50 to 70 years and has to be repopulated from birds from Mexico, but they can't fly over the fence. They won't fly over the fence. So the fence effectively is, is greatly reducing the spread and the migration of animals. And this is a bit of a problem because, um, because life doesn't recognize those political borders. Um, oops, let me not go there yet. Um, <laughs> life doesn't recognize political borders and life has to move to accommodate for change. Like it or not, we're in the middle of climate change. It's happening. If you don't believe me, talk to anyone who is a gardener. Right? The South Carolina Botanical Garden, our minimum winter temperature has come up 10 degrees in the last two decades. That our number of days over 100 degrees went from zero to 16 on average. So we've had to change our entire collections. We no longer have a rhododendron collection. We had 30 or 40 species of rhododendron in our garden. Today we can only grow the ones that grow in the coastal and Piedmont areas that are the native deciduous azaleas. Our entire Taubiens hybrid uh, collection is gone because we can't keep them alive. But we can grow palmetto trees now. And we have a wonderful collection of palms now, like cats, at the South Carolina Botanical Garden. So we're in the middle of climate change, and we know from the past that life has to move to deal with change. But we do things like this because we're worried about illegal immigration. Should we be worried about illegal immigration? Yes. Is this a way to deal with illegal immigration? It keeps out those things that are parts of our natural heritage and it's gonna reduce our biodiversity and it's gonna keep things from migrating. The one thing that knows how to get through and around and under and over that fence is people. Right, it's stupid. Um, so a great example of a knee-jerk reaction to a real problem 
um, that's politicized that we allow to rule our hearts to make decisions that don't make any sense. So I get a chance to go all over the world, and um, I want to illustrate to you really just how important this chunk of the world, this very piece of property is to the persistence on the planet. All those pictures are pictures from South Chile. Um, I've been really lucky to spend a lot of time working in the Valdivian rainforest and was lucky enough to, to do a, a survey of a, uh, two new national parks in Chile in the last couple, in the last couple years. I haven't been there in two years, but, um, or three years. But back when I was working in Chile, I worked in the Valdivian rainforest, beautiful place. Uh, Corcovado National Park and Lago Copa National Park in Chile. And uh, when I... <laughs> I went down with a group of people and I met the president of Chile. Uh, she came to this resort to go on a hike and she just thought I was like, knew everything about Chile. I really only knew everything about the few things, the eight things that were on that trail. But she, she decided, she decided that, um, that I needed to do this survey on this new national park. And so, do you say no to Michelle Bachelet? No. Um, but I, I had to learn everything about this area um, before I worked there, um, because I had to, to survey all the plants and animals, fish, the whole nine yards of these new national parks, and incredibly expansive, hard to get around national parks. 574 vascular species alone of plants um, in the Valdivian rainforest. And um, you know how long it took me to learn them? I had to learn all but two, because they do have dandelions and uh, uh, cud, uh, cudweed. Um, but other than that, I had to learn 572. I learned them on the plane to Chile. <laughs> Um, and if you're wondering how I can do that, that's all I do. Um, but also, it's the fact that I live in Pickens County, South Carolina, or work in Pickens County. I live in Anderson, work in Pickens County. We have 1,875 species in Pickens County. You have over 2,500 living in Buncombe County, North Carolina. Um, in North Carolina, there's 4,200 species. There's 6,000 species in the Southern Appalachians of plants. And the best that southern South America's rainforest could pull off is 574? That's an afternoon study for me. <laughs> we overlook the incredible diversity that's right here in our backyard. We live in one of the world's great havens of biodiversity in the temperate world, especially here in the Blue Ridge Escarpment region where we sit right now today. Um, diversity that we see and we notice, most of you guys know sweet shrub, that wonderful Concord grape smelling flower, but also these weird, almost, they're not real true capsules, but they're like bags of seeds. You break them open and the seeds, when you warm them up in your hands, smell like Concord grapes. And my granny used to, uh, again, my grandmother, she used to wear a little sachet of them around her neck. And um, the seeds in the fall, I'd go collect bags of seeds for her, and she would make a little sachet, hang them on her neck, and they would sort of warm up and, and perfume. It was an old Cherokee tradition, too, um, to wear the seeds of Concord grapes as perfume, natural perfume for ladies. And so whenever I drink a glass of Welsh's grape juice or smell a Concord grape smell, I'm thinking about my grandmother, and it was always, my granny was real affectionate and not real small. So when she, <laughs> she would grab you, you would just like be fighting for your, you know, for air. And that, that image is continually in my mind is, is uh, that sort of feeling of being um, uh, loved, let's say. <laughs> but I learned real quick that for me to be successful in getting grandma uh, a lot of the seeds of sweet shrub, I had to get there pretty quick in the fall first two weeks in October, because after that, there'd be a little hole gnawed into each one of the capsules that was made by this, um, which is the, the golden mouse, an arboreal mouse that lives in the bushes and the trees and spends almost no time on the ground. And one of its favorite foods is the seeds of sweet shrub. Beautiful animal, really long fingers for grabbing onto branches. And, and I don't know if you can see in that bottom picture, he's hanging by his tail. They have prehensile tails like spider monkeys. And how many of you guys have seen a golden mouse? No one, right? Well, if you watch Expeditions with Patrick McMillan, you yeah. golden mice. But you don't see golden mice, but yet it's a part of our natural heritage right here on this property. I guarantee you in about 10 minutes, I could walk down the valley here and find you golden mice because they look like a bird mouse nest, or like a uh, bird nest that's up in the bushes, typically in dendrons along streams and privet in neighborhoods. You find their nests made, and they're really common here. They're just not seen because they're only out at night. So we have this incredible diversity we know about. We have an incredible diversity we don't know about. They all have these interconnections. 
And we have just an incredible array of things here that are really hard to see elsewhere in the world. Things like pygmy pipes. Uh, how many of you guys know about this? Smells like cloves and you have to go out in the woods in February and March to find it and usually sweep away leaves because those little tiny flowers are held underneath the leaves but they have this intense fragrance that allows you to find them only if you get down on your hands and knees and, and search out the scent on a warm day when it's above 60 degrees in March. Um, you find these things, right? We also, it's not just the diversity we have, it's what we have. We have more species of things like trillium per square inch here in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, this very area where we're sitting. More species of trillium per square inch here than any other similar sized area in the world. More species of salamander in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. Do not let those guys in the Great Smoky Mountains fool you. They make up two of the species of salamanders they have over there. They, they're not sure they're even found there, but we know we have 64 here. And they, uh, salamanders, trillium, ginger, all of these groups of plants, we have more diversity here than anywhere else per square inch of land. And why is that? It's the same reason that when you walk down into East Otoe Gorge, you can be looking at a fern, the Tunbridge fern, that grows in East Otoe Gorge and nowhere else in North America is a tropical fern, one of a suite of tropical ferns, that's growing underneath a striped maple that should be in Canada. <laughs> it's because we have an area that I call a crucible of life through times of change. It's an incredible region that has microclimates because of the dissection of the land, because of all the gorges, because of the fact that our mountains here in Polk County, when they reach Polk County, they instead of running north-south, they start to run east-west. And they catch all that gulf moisture, and they have all that water, the highest rainfall in eastern North America, that causes Lots of erosion to build deep gorges and down in the bottom of the gorge the wind never blows, the sun never shines and the temperature is always cooler in the summertime, warmer in the wintertime and when we go through an ice age or when we go through a, a, a hot time in the world, it's always ameliorated down there at the bottom. Providing little sanctuaries for life to survive change, especially things that can't move very fast like trillium and salamanders. That's what those two things have in common. Well, we talked about the impact of the wall but you know what, for, for all of the life that makes its living in a deciduous forest, it's been really important that those species are able to get to the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, the place we're at right now, and get back out of it during times of change. And today, in states like South Carolina, that area between the coast and the mountains that species have to migrate through back and forth and back and forth up the Savannah and the Santee River drainages, where all of us live, Population centers are, it's the Piedmont. Yards are the corridors into and out of these wonderful places. Our southern Blue Ridge Escarpment is mostly protected. We have a large amount of public property up here along the edge of the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. Incredible pieces of property like this that have been set away that are so important for the things we've been talking about. But in between is this, right? So how important is your backyard? Pretty important. This provides amazingly absolutely nothing that life needs. Zero. And yet most of the yards in Polk and Rutherford County, when you look at them in Henderson County, they look like that. Maybe not that nice, but you know, they're pretty good. Um, this is actually out in Greeley, Colorado. It was the worst yard I've ever seen, but I, I told the guy, I was like, oh my gosh, can I take a picture of this? He said, he said sure, yeah, you, I'm real proud of it. I said, I promise you, I'll use it all the time, uh, every show I do. He went on and on telling me about how, how much money he has to spend on chemicals to keep it looking like that and, and, uh, and you know, how much he has to, 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 uh, to mow on that yard. Um, and it doesn't provide food, habitat, or water. It provides absolutely nothing that life needs to make a living. And in South Carolina, 89% of our land is in private ownership. Only 11% is in public trust. That means the choices we make in our backyard are going to determine what we have. And especially during times of change, when species have to migrate between the coastal plain, where we have some national forests and protected property, and the mountains, where we have national forests and protected property, is our backyard. That's the same as the border fence. In times of change, water's important too. And that lawn doesn't just stop the movement of wildlife. That lawn needs water to stay that green. And a study was done here in North Carolina in Cary, says that the average lawn there in Cary, which is a big lawn, 5,000 square feet, uses 30,000 gallons of potable water over June, July, and August. 
Now, if we multiply that out by the 4.2 million homes that we have in South Carolina or the, I don't know, 8 million homes you have in North Carolina, just a fraction of that, imagine the amount of water that we are wasting and taking out of the watershed and out of our aquifers and dumping out on the ground in a time when water is becoming a premium, both because of the pressures of our population and the pressures of change. So lawns, big change. Make one change in your life that's going to leave an impact on the world. It's get rid of the grass. Minimize the grass. You want to fight the war on climate? You fight the war on lawns. It's one of the things we can all kind of agree on and say, you know what, this doesn't involve me giving up my SUV or anything else. I can continue to do these things, but I can be part of the solution of allowing life to persist through change just simply by not having a lawn. And you know what? These, um, <laughs> the other thing you can do is to ensure that land trusts thrive. Because you, you see right here on this property the power of easements, of land trusts, of conservation uh, decisions that are made on private property. And what a huge and critical part of the puzzle of keeping life around it is. It's a choice that we all can make whether we have land to put into an easement or whether we just have a few bucks that we can use to support a land trust. It's so important that we all do that. And it's not just for the incredible biodiversity we see, but it's also for our connection. So that our gener the generations to come will continue to have the quality of life that we have. Let's see if I can give you just uh, one more example. I'm not even going to use that example. Yeah, go away, bird. Move. Move. It always happens. I always leave folks with this idea of how long you're, you will be remembered and how important each and every one of us is. Because we've talked about big things and some little things today. But let's, let's end up with one really big thing that happened because of just one person. Um, sugar maple may not be the most exciting thing in the world, but sugar maple, when you think of it, you think, oh, yeah, there's probably sugar maple on this property. There's sugar maple in the mountains of North Carolina. There's sugar maple in Canada. It's on their flag. But you don't think about sugar maple being in Charleston. But that picture was taken in Charleston County, that sugar maple tree. And in Charleston, we have sugar maple in Charleston County only on these coastal islands where the soil pH is really high. Sugar maple is deciduous, and on these islands where we have really high pH soil, deciduous trees can thrive. It's because it's so acid down there, because nutrients are really low in acid soil. That's why we have rhododendrons in really acid soils up here, and why down in the low country we have things like live oak and cedar and palmetto and all the evergreen species thriving on the coast, not because it's subtropical, because it's acid soil. But when you remove the acidity, when you make it kind of neutral, suddenly you have sugar maple and basswood and hackberry and dogwood and underneath them trillium growing on a coastal island off of Charleston, trillium, and things you can find nowhere else in, in South Carolina except on these strange islands like Godfrey Swamp, Leafless Swallowwort, Shell Midden Morning Glory, um, Shell Midden Cactus, all these weird things growing there only because they have high pH. And the only reason they have high pH, you'll notice the ring here, a ring here, a ring here, a ring here. Those are rings of shells that were dumped there by people 5,200 years ago. And the shell contains calcium carbonate. And the calcium carbonate in the shell raises the pH of the soil, which has allowed a habitat for things that can't grow anywhere else on the coastal fringe to grow. And it's not just these monstrous piles of shell. If you look on the island, these little uh, trees here, these are also sugar maple trees. But they're growing where a single bucket of shells was dumped on the ground 5,000 years ago. So, throw a shell down and change the world. How much bigger are the choices that we make every day in our lives than throwing a shell on the ground? Each and every one of us is really, really, really important. And the choices we make are never going to be forgotten. I always tell people, your great, 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 great,
thousands of years ago to, to start a fire to the fact that, that some American, Native American lady threw a bucket of shells on the ground has changed everything about the diversity. And the great thing about it is it's not all bad. The activities of people, the choices can be good ones that raise the biodiversity, raise the quality of life, raise the, the, the wonderful things that we're able to experience in the Carolinas today because somebody made a choice 5,200 years ago. You are important. And one of the most important things that you can do is what you're doing today, which is supporting these land trusts that are such a huge part of maintaining our identity, our sense of space, sense of place, our personal spaces that have been so critical to keeping nature naturally Carolinian. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.